What right. up? This is Rama Screen and in the anticipation of Gunpowder Milkshake arriving July 14 only on Netflix. I'm here talking with the score composer of this new female centric action film, Frank Ilfman. How are you, Frank? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you for asking. Doing well. Doing well. Excellent. So let me start with the obvious question here. How did you get on board this project? And what was your conversation like with director Navot in those early stages? Um, well, I know I know uh, never for for a few very good years. Like we worked on his first film called Rabies, and then we uh, we did uh, Big Bad Wolf, which was quite successful. And then uh, we did another segment. I think was uh, what was it ABC of Death. And so we we've been working for a long time, and we have a, you know we have quite a bond, and we're we're very good friends. Besides, you know, filmmaking and. Um, and we we share the same kind of love for old films and and music, and um, you know it was just a natural thing when it came down to gunpowder for me to do the score, um, and so so we have this kind of rapport where I already know how he works and and where he wants to take stuff or he will temp because uh, he's very musical so he will temp a lot of stuff with um, various various scores and songs, um, which would lead to some direction or, you know, parts of stuff that were usually discussed quite early on. Um, and then I know like how to take those different influences and then mash it and blend it into like something that will have its own personality for, for his film. So that's usually how we work. I've watched this film, by the way, and I had you such a blast. Yeah, I had so uh, much fun. Uh, with the uh, gunpowder milkshake. And I got to ask you the burning question because in that bowling alley scene, your music there kind of emulates Ennio Morricone's Spaghetti Western. At least that's the impression I got when I heard it. Was that part of your influence? Uh, was that subconscious or intentional on your part? No, it's, it's um, everything is like quite, uh, it's quite to the point. It's, um, with with gunpowder because it's 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 a weird kind of genre blender of a few kind of you know it has this kind of revenge samurai comic stuff and then it has that kind of western um, if you've seen the film then you know where the stages are as you say um, and then um, you know uh, she's an assassin and that's it's it's a blend of like film noir spy movies comics and even some Western, even though it doesn't take place during the Wild Wild West, but it has that kind of staginess to it. And actually, since um, even before they were shooting um, and I went on set, we, you know, our playlist was divided from like a lot of these kind of um, Italian, French, uh, 60s uh, scores and songs and pop songs. Uh, so we have uh, Stilvio Capiriani and we had Ennio and um, Alessandro Alessoni and all these guys, actually. And then we had some Henry Mancini. Mm. And um, so so we wanted to pay kind of like homage to all these things. And, um, you know, for me, it was it had something important because uh, for me, I had a, quite a strong connection with with Ennio Morricone throughout the years. Um, a few a few times that we spoke and and met and uh, so I, I always seen him besides like a big influence or also as a as a sort of a mentor so I wanted to play you know when we did the the we spoke about the idea of doing that kind of spaghetti western influences um I wanted to do it in a in a, like a very respectful way so you know it's not just to kind of mimic the 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 characters so they become a bit you know over the top grotesque kind of a thing but to have that kind of more emotional content with those spaghetti western themes um so uh, you know you can hear it in this in the standoff at, at, you know when they have the standoff at the end and then in different parts you do have those influences um so we wanted to pay homage to that to the, those kind of uh you know, Anton Karas type scores and Bernard Herrmann. Um, so everything is, is, is to the point. It's, it's, there's a few of them that are quite a, uh, you know, quite a hands-on homage to, 
to those kind of stuff. Yeah. Yes, and it does fit the uh, like you said. There's a noir feel to it. There's retro modern tone to it as well. I think the last movie I saw that had a, had that similar style was Drew Goddard's 2018 film Bad Times at the El Royale. So with that film, funny enough, I have a feeling from I watched that and it has quite a quite a, a nice score and and I really enjoyed it. And I think at some point, I think that was temp with uh, big bad wolf from what i've heard nice nice yeah. now it's a good film i really enjoyed that yeah. <laughs> uh, so talk to me about the instruments that you incorporated to capture the essence for gunpowder milkshake i read somewhere that you included some electronic sounds with some orchestral what were those instruments uh, exactly and what were those sounds specifically we wanted like to be quite authentic with some of the instrumentation that um, we used, um, besides like having a huge orchestra and choir and all that kind of stuff, um, we wanted still with some of the instrument that we wanted to portray those kind of um, 60s style scores and songs. Um, I've used uh, something called a, um, like a Kimbalone, which is like this kind of dulcimer. And then I've used like a harpsichord and a combination mm. of those and then uh, I sampled uh, one of the Kimbalon that was used throughout um, some of the Morricone scores back in the day. So I, I used a sample of that one because I couldn't fly actually to go and record that instrument. Um, and then we used a lot of like old, um, old spring reverbs to create those kind of spaghetti western sound. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we really cranked up a lot of those reverbs. So we wanted to have like really authentic sounds. Uh, so we, you know, when so when you hear it, it's not just like okay, we kind of um, created like a, a mock-up of you know a modern version of that. We wanted to really have that essence of those you know old uh, cheap sounds back in the day that they were trying to create. And then um, also we wanted, in a way, I guess, to have that kind of retro feel. So we used a lot of like old Moogs and drum machines on top of all the guitars and as i said orchestra and stuff i think the idea was to blend all of that in a way that it will work it was not an easy easy task to try and make it work so it's a one thing you know uh, because each of the sound are so um so unique hmm. and you know we used um we used the pheromin in some of the cues um and then there's some cues that we use just loads of mandolins and bouzoukis and stuff and harmonica but the idea was to to even if we do go retro, we do go to those um, I would say type old school uh, scores. We wanted the sound to be really authentic, so literally use those instruments to create it, which was not easy because it was all done during the pandemic. Funny enough, I also read on the press note here, in keeping with the film's theme of female empowerment, uh, Ifman used female musician soloists on much of the score, especially for the action tracks, which have elements of 80s female rock band flair and were, rec were recorded with mostly female performers. How did that work? So the, the idea from, from the start was that we, you know, as you say in the bowling thing, which it is very kind of like, it's almost like, it's almost, it's almost like a homage to Ecstasy of Gold but on, on, on acid, you know, it has, it's, it's have, you know, it's, it's a combination of grunge and, and rock and, and whistling and choir and the orchestra and all that. Um, the idea I think was that, you know, because it's a, it's, it's all the heroes are, are female. Um, so I wanted to, to create this kind of pop rock group that will, you know, will be featured on most of the parts besides, you know, the, the the orchestra and so they'll be the lead so we have i just used to call them um the beauties and the beat <laughs> you know so, so uh, yeah the idea was that uh sam's theme and which is is kind of works the same with um with Emily's theme is uh, sung by Grace Davidson, who does the soprano and all the all the cues. So that's always represented by by a human female voice, and then um, and then all the action cues, uh, you know, all the the guitars and sound manipulation is done by Charlotte. So that's also you know, so like all the main uh, 
cues are done by 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 that kind of super group of rockers that I put together. Along that same line, uh, this movie also features a few retro popular songs, including Janis Joplin's iconic rendition of the uh, "Piece of My Heart," and then it transitions back to your score, of course, again. So I'm sure beforehand you already knew uh, which songs, which popular songs that director Navot is going to place and where exactly is going to be placed. So um, how do you design your score to complement them or to pick up where those songs left off to make sure there's a consistency, you know, with, with the with the retro feel that you want to, you know, achieve? Funny enough, we I remember doing like our conversation on the score and we had like this um we had like this huge playlist that that um, Nevot and I created of all the kind of scores and songs that we, you know, uh, Nevot wanted in the film and thought could work as a temp. Mm -hmm. And um, then I think, I think back then, I don't think uh, Janis Joplin was in the picture. I think uh, originally they had, I think there was some 70s song and then both of all those action scenes were actually, including the Janis Joplin song, was scored hmm. and recorded. Interesting. So actually, the Janis Joplin uh, cue is what is now part of the untitled cue. So that big action cue that's right at the end, that was actually that scene. Um, and then um, I think it's, I think this and the one before uh, we were supposed to, I think it was supposed to be some uh, David, uh, some David Bowie track, hmm. but actually we found that in the test screening, the score actually worked better. Uh, so that went back. I think that was to the death. So that kind of went back in instead of that. So only the Janis Joplin stayed, but, but all those songs are, again, they're, they're in those kind of 60s, 70s vibes. So um, a lot of them do work with the score. I wasn't really, um, I was aware of some of the songs, but I wasn't um, taking any notes of how those songs, you know, sound compared to how we wanted the uh, score to sound. Um, I think this is just, uh, just shows how musical Nevot is when he does those kind of selections. So a lot of those songs, uh, I think, uh, besides maybe one or two, uh, that stayed from the original time. They changed throughout the throughout you know throughout the process uh, while the score was being recorded. Well, but he's just very, he's, he's just very good musically that he knows what will work with what. But it was never a point. Oh, we need to make it sound like this song and so. On. Got you, got you. Well, I tell you, Frank, this movie is so badass, and part of why it's badass is because of your music. It's a big yeah, part of uh, the, the highlights of uh, Gunpowder Milkshake. So before I let you go, finally, um, what's next on your horizon? Uh, and are you going to collaborate with director Navot again? Yeah, I mean, we, we've we been working for years. For us, it's kind of second nature. So, um, you know, whenever he does something and he'll call me, if he still wants me, then yeah, we'll do. I'm sure he will. Um, but uh, no, at the moment, um, uh, I'm kind of taking a bit of a break because I just need to um, rewire the whole studio. And uh, because when we started working on the film, it was just like, you know, gathering all the synth and stuff. And it was just, it was just a mess. So right now I said, okay, if that's now there's a bit of a break. It's, it's that time to try and do it and, and kind of get it done, you know, done properly, you know, before the next one, so. We'll see. We'll see. Apparently, they announced Gunpowder Milkshake too, so we'll see. Yeah, that was, uh, is, that is that official or not yet? Well, you know, as far as I know, that's what uh, Studio Canal was announcing uh, today. As far as you know, I haven't I haven't heard it myself, but that's what uh, you know. So, not that I'm aware that there is a you know <laughs> Gunpowder too. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but maybe it's a, maybe it's a new franchise. We'll see. You know. It'll be good. <laughs> That got me really, really excited. So uh, hopefully that happens. And uh, for my fans at home, everybody go check out Gunpowder Milkshake arriving July 14, only on Netflix. Frank, thank you for talking to me and congratulations. Thank you very much. My pleasure.